Uh, okay, so homework two. This should be, yeah, we, we had a chat about this. I thought it got released, but maybe it needs to actually get the final thing. So we'll, I'll have Anthony do that today. So, so FYI, homework two is going out. It'll be two weeks-ish. Um, and then, so two questions again. And um, the first one is Newton Euler stuff, SE3 stuff, like we talked about. Um, so this is, you're going to fly a glider and um, make it do some fun things. So this is a bunch of aerodynamic things that you get to implement. Um, a lot of this is boilerplate, and then you just have to fill in a few things. Um, a little code from a glider that I played with as a postdoc. Uh, OK, yeah, so basically compute force and torques, blah, blah, blah. This is sort of gnarly, but it's, it's all like straightforward. It's a bunch of coordinate transformation stuff. And then, yeah, basically implement the new Euler dynamics like we talked about. And then a um, little root finding fun. So like using Newton's method to find some trim conditions. So it flies straight and level, kind of cool. Um, what else we got in here? Um, and then trying some different integration methods, trying like the uh, RKMK stuff out. And we have a little visualizer. I could do a loop. This is fun. Uh, yeah. I think that's kind of that. So yeah, a bunch of like this SE3 stuff though. Kind of, so that should be fun. So we've already done that stuff. The next question is the stuff we're going to start talking about hopefully Thursday. So today we're going to do another round of like kind of review stuff on um, um, optimization stuff. And we're going to start talking about a little bit about calculus of variations. And this is, uh, we're going to talk about this in class. Um, like kind of Thursday into next Tuesday, probably. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's super annoying. Anyway, um, so the cat has anyone heard of the catenary problem? It's like a very famous classic problem in calculus of variations. It's the shape of a hanging chain or like a rope. And you take a rope or a chain and hold it by the ends and let it like just hang under gravity. It's the shape that that makes. Turns out like it's one of the like kind of classic benchmark problems in this this area of calculus of variations. It turns out the math is exactly the same as like all of dynamics and optimal control also. So in some sense, like all of physics and optimal control are like hanging chain problems. Just fun. So we're going to do that because it's also like the easiest problem. It's basically it, the way to think about it is it's a dynamics problem where there's zero kinetic energy, right? So if you think about the Lagrange, it's just potential energy. And literally what you do is say, okay, it's not moving. Therefore, kinetic energy is zero. So now I just need to minimize potential energy, right? So it's kind of like the simplest gateway into this kind of stuff, this Lagrangian energy-based dynamics stuff. So that's where we're going to talk about it. So you basically like straight up just minimize potential energy and out pops that shape. Uh, and it's cool. It has the exact same flavor as a trajectory optimization problem with an initial state and a goal state or one of these dynamics problems like the Hamilton's principle stuff. So this, we're going to do it in class. And then this is basically like forcing you to like dig deeper and do a bunch of other things with it. Um, so that's question two. We're going to actually have you directly minimize the thing with IP ops with an optimizer, write your own little Newton thing, solve a continuous version as an ODE. I kind of just play with it in a whole bunch of different weird ways. Um, so that's the second question. Should be fun. Um, any questions about that stuff or anything else logistics wise? Cool. And yeah, I said it before, but basically the... Um, so the game plan for the next few days, today we're going to finish talking about optimization. We're going to talk about constraints, so equality and inequality constraints and KQT conditions. That should basically take care of us for like optimization background for the rest of the class. Um, and then after that, so probably Thursday, we're going to start talking about calculus of variations and like these style of optimization problems, like hanging chains and trajectories and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's kind of time to take us in then next week, and that'll take care of you for the homework and stuff. Uh, any Anything else? Uh, the last thing I want to mention, projects. So you guys had to submit this little project proposal things. Um, I want to talk to everybody, like, or either individual or group, like whatever you submitted as, um, in the next say, couple of weeks to try to dial it in. So I'm going to read those, and then I'll put some like sign up slots for times to talk over the next say two weeks. Um, so just I basically, uh, I just want to make sure we scope them so that it's a reasonable amount of work that I think you can plausibly get done by the end of the semester. That's mostly what I, I topic-wise you can do whatever you want, but I just mostly wanna make sure you're doing a sane amount of, you're like not biting off more than you can chew or whatever. Um, cool, all right. Anything else? Everybody good? All right, cool. So we'll get into it then. Homework two, two weeks-ish. So I'll probably make it like the Wednesday after next um, in terms of deadline. And definitely let me know if there's someone hanging out who can't get into the Zoom or whatever. I'm gonna try to. 
weirdly, it, it acts super weird when you have two screens. Uh, okay, cool. So, iPad, let's see, will the iPad work? It is not working the way I want it to, because it never does. So, reflector is on. This is not working. Why would it work? You know, why would it work like this? It's so terrible. The AV stuff is always terrible. We're trying. Yeah, literally, like it's hilarious when you, the, the best is when you're at like a job interview. This literally my first, my first academic job interview. I was supposed to be like a seminar talk and they, they literally couldn't figure out the projector for a solid 25 minutes. So it ate through half my time. I was supposed to be giving a job talk. And I think everyone just felt so bad for me <laughs> by the time I actually got up there that I had like a super sympathetic audience. It was kind of good, but it was like just laugh. It was like one of these classic like, like sitcom scenarios. Like you show up for a job interview and they can't make the projector work. And there's like all these people running around and I'm just like standing there. <laughs> Classic, so classic. It's a very complicated light bulb, that's right. Okay, I think it's working. I don't love any of this, but I don't know. It's, it's what we're dealing with, so here we go. Okay, so what did we do last time? Um, so last time we did like a bunch of like optimization background stuff, right? So we talked about um, root finding, um, minimization, how to turn minimization into root finding. So you can use Newton's method. Uh, what else? We talked about um, sort of the weirdo stuff that happens when you try to solve non-convex problems, right? So we talked about regularization. And then uh, we kind of just snuck in at the end this uh, line search idea. And so basically, those are all the tools you really need to do general nonlinear optimization. I mean, that's that's kind of it. There's some other things you can do, but Newton's method with regularization and a line search is basically it. Like, if you do that, you can solve like pretty much general, general smooth nonlinear optimization problems. It's pretty good. Um, does anyone have any questions about that stuff? We've seen a good chunk of that before. I think some of that's at least covered in like RoboMath. Okay, so today we are going to talk about. Um, oh, actually, my camera's off, apparently. It's important. Um, so we're going to now we're going to talk about constraints today. So we're going to talk about. Um, First, equality constraints, and then um, inequality constraints. And in our context, uh, equality constraints in, in dynamics typically correspond to things like uh, joint constraints on a robot, right? So like, especially in closed loops, you guys have probably, at least if you've done any of this, you've heard of like the kind of irritating differences between like, serial chain and closed loop uh, manipulators and things like this. So you you almost always need equality constraints to write down uh, complicated mechanical systems. So often like I mean, if a robot has like a four bar closed loop thing, you, you need a constraint to write that down. Uh, so they show up in a lot of cases. There's there's many use cases for that. And inequality constraints where those show up in, in the kind of context we're gonna talk about here is contact. So basically like roughly speaking, if you wanna simulate like a foot in you know, hitting the floor or something like this. The way to write that down is as an inequality constraint that says the foot's height has got to be you know greater than equal to zero or something. Basically, you write down an inequality constraint to say that you forbid interpenetration between bodies and things like that. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're going to be sort of doing the the background crash course version of of optimization. So definitely.
don't be shy if you got questions and stuff and need to slow down. Okay, so, so far we did this. All right, where this guy is, um, from Rn to R, eats a vector, spits out a scalar. And now we're gonna add constraints. So this, this is gonna be subject to some C of X equals zero. And basically we always, just by convention, this is like the standard form. So any kind of equality constraint you have, you just smoosh it into that form where that guy is from Rn, so it eats an X, right, to Rm. So it's a vector valued function now, right? And so the idea there is if you have a bunch of constraints, you just stack them all up into one big C function and you smush everything over to the left-hand side. So it's all equal to zero. So we just got to get whatever, and you can always do this, right? So that's kind of the standard thing. Okay, so the intuition, for for these things now, we're going to talk about what are called first order necessary conditions. So we talked about this, you know, last time, um, and so first order means first derivative is what that refers to, right? So sort of what we talked about last time was an example of these. We need the uh, the gradient of f to equal zero at an optimum, right? But now with the constraint stuff, it's slightly different. So the, the additional thing is that it has to equal zero in the free directions. So this is very intuitive, right? It's like, if I've got a constraint and I've got an objective function, I can only zero out the gradient in the directions that I'm allowed to move subject to the constraints, right? So that's the best we can do. So it only has to be zero in the free directions. You can have non-zero objective gradient in the constrained directions where I'm not allowed to move. That's okay, right? So everyone got that? So that's number one, and that's kind of what we had last time. And then the second one is, again, sort of obvious. We also need the constraints to be satisfied at X star. So that's easy enough. So now we're gonna draw the cartoon picture of this whole idea of like free directions. So we've got, say, um, some nice, like quadratic E function. Uh, so like this would be, you know, say we have, we're in 2D, so we've got an X1 and an X2. And let's say the, this would be something like, you know, X squared, F of X equals X squared or something. So right now I'm drawing level curves of F. So the minimum's at the origin, right? And now I've got a constraint. So let's say it's a nice linear constraint, something like this. So this is the line C of X equals zero. So I need to minimize the function subject to the constraint, right? So I'm gonna draw some gradients of the constraint now. So like here's a del F, here's another del F, right? This kind of thing. So the gradient points in direction of increasing uh, F, right? So this is the bottom of the bowl. So the gradients are pointing uphill, right? So, um, and then I'm gonna also draw gradient of C. So if this is C of X equals zero, I'm going to draw this sort of thing. All right. So basically, the way to think about it, if C is a linear function, like it's basically a big ramp going this way, right? Going up this way. So that's pointing up here on the C function. And the constraint is that the solution has to lie along the line C of X equals zero. So that's sort of where C is crossing the, the plane, right? Okay. So uh, intuitively, we know where the, the answer is here, right? It's going to be the lowest point along this line, which is over here, right? So I can't get to the origin because I got to stay on this line. So it's essentially the closest point that's on the line to the to the origin in this picture, right? So let's take a close look at what happens there. At that point, like intuitively, what's happening is for this to be true, it's a point where the C of X equals zero line is tangent to a level curve, like you can see from the picture, right? So this is. In this spot, this is grad F, right? So maybe I'll write some notes here. So this is like F of X. Here's from R2 to R. And then C of X 
is also, it just so happens from R2 to R, because that's sort of the limit of what I can draw. And, you know, okay, so let's talk about the picture a little bit. So kind of, like you said, right, it's got to be, the gradient of F has to be zero in the free directions, right? Um, so another way of saying that is that um, I'm going to basically say the same thing like three different ways, and hopefully one of those makes sense to you. <laughs> Uh, so any non-zero component of rad f must be normal to the constraint surface or manifold. That's sort of the, the fancy math name for like this in higher dimensions, right? Okay, so that makes sense to everybody. So same same story, right? Grad F has to be zero in the free directions. The sort of equivalent way of saying that is it can only be non-zero in the non-free directions, right? Because that means I'm allowed to have a grad F, but grad F cannot have any component that points along the C equals zero direction. That's totally orthogonal to it, right? Okay, so here's how we're gonna write this down in math. We have grad F plus lambda, and everyone's you know seen some version of this before, I'm assuming. So what this is saying for some lambda, this is a scalar here. Okay, so the idea is I'm allowed to have non-zero here, but it has to be parallel to the normal of C. This is literally saying this in math, right? It's saying like, you're allowed to have non-zero thing here, but it has to be in the same point in the same direction as the surface normal, right? So that's to be totally perpendicular. And basically what the lambda is there for is to make the lengths match here so that this can equal strictly equal zero. So this is just saying it's parallel. That's all that equation says, right? If it's for some any lambda, this can be true. That's just saying the parallel vectors and they can be sort of any length, right? And this lambda is there just to like impedance match the lengths. And the name for this is sort of like impedance matchy thing is Lagrange multiplier. Or also called dual variable in optimization and lots of, so the, the other thing is these things have lots of different names and different fields. Like every field that does some version of this has like another name for the Lambda. And you've probably encountered this before. Okay, so the general case, for any questions about this, who's seen this before? Most people have seen this before, some version of this, right? Yeah. It literally doesn't matter, right? So lambda in this case can be positive or negative. Does, it's like, it's just like the lambda will suck up the, the sign, right? So um, yeah, it, it's totally arbitrary. You, you can write it with a minus sign if you want to. I'll just change lambda. Because lambda is an arbitrary constant, right? It's sort of whatever. Okay, cool. So in the general case, so in like higher dimensions, right? Beyond the picture, you get the following thing. You have like grad X plus lambda transpose dc dx equals zero. And in general, this lambda is actually a vector and it's size m. So if I have m constraints, I get m lambdas, right? I basically get a lambda per constraint. If I stack all the constraints up in one big C, so C is n by m, then the lambda has got to be m dimensional to make that all work out. Yeah. DC dx is a vector. It, uh, this is a good, so it's actually a, um, so it is if it's one dimensional, as is this, right? This is the way I wrote it. And in that case, lambda is a scalar. Right. In the more general case, this guy's a Jacobian matrix. So it's got lots of rows. Oh, okay. And this, um, basically you get one of these per row, right? Mm -hmm. So that that works out. So at the end of the day, you get out a row vector. Makes sense. The re this is the, the transposy stuff will drive you nuts. So yeah. like, I apologize for that. It's just the way it is. When I read it this way, it means row vector. This is the other thing. This is like the straightforward definition of the Jacobian, standard definition of the yeah. Jacobian. And this kind of works out. 
if you play games with like not following the conventions, you will absolutely write buggy code and drive yourself nuts. So stick to the convention. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you like define this to be a column, then like sometimes people define like non-standard definitions of the Jacobian that's like transpose or something. This is all bad. You don't want that. Okay. So, um, so based on this, so this is cool. This comes from that picture. And it's literally just this idea of grad has to equal zero in the three directions. I throw this Lagrange multiplier thing in there just to make the lengths match up so that equation can equal zero. And it's sort of this arbitrary scalar. Based on this though, I can sort of now take a step back and write down the following thing. This will also get annoying. Uh, I apologize. It's not my fault. Um, so this is optimization lingo. Closely related. We're going to find this thing called the Lagrangian, which is not the same Lagrangian as in mechanics, uh, which is super irritating. But hopefully you will not get too messed up from this because it turns out Mostly these are the same thing, in, in, uh, but they're subtly different, I guess. Okay, so this thing is called the Lagrangian in optimization. It's closely related to the Lagrangian of dynamics that we will also talk about in this class, but um, not exactly the same thing. Okay, so this is the Lagrangian, yeah. Yeah, let's try that. How about blue? I like blue. I don't know if it lets me do, oh, it does let me do custom colors. Let's try that. Yeah, you just make this a little darker. Uh, uh, how about, here's a darker shade of green. Let's try the darker green. I'll, I'll keep cruising with the darker green. Okay, so Lagrangian. So the reason we do this is it makes the like sort of classic set the gradient of everything equal to zero condition sort of work in the constrained case. So now with this definition, I can write down just grad L equals zero again, but we'll sort of break it up so to, it makes sense. So if I take grad with respect to X of this guy, I get the, um, and now I'm gonna write a transpose to drop, drive you extra crazy, just cause you, you'll have to get used to this whole mess, right? Um, and then if I write grad respect to lambda down, I just get back the original constraint. So that's kind of cool. So I can group this all together, right? In this one condition that's just grad of L equals zero, like I had before. And this set of conditions now with this Lagrange multiplier E gradient equals zero condition and the constant condition, all of which is grad of L equals zero. That's called KKT conditions. So these are the, the first order necessary conditions for a constrained optimization problem. So it's grad equals zero, grad in the free directions equals zero, and constraint has to equal zero, all right, all together. And um, this, is, this is only with equality constraints. So we're going to do the inequality constraints in a sec. Any questions about this, though? This is just, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yep, yep, thanks. Everybody that is doing anything else stupid, they're all good. Okay, cool. So, and then basically as before, we can solve this with Newton's method, kind of like we're used to doing. And it looks exactly the same, right? It's just another root finding problem, but now it's on grad L equals zero, right? But there's some nice special structure in this that we should talk about, so that's coming. So we've got, this guy, and what I'm going to do is write down this like little Taylor expansion thing. So hopefully it's extra clear. So we're going to do that, right? I'm going to Taylor expand in both arguments. So this is to first order grad L plus it's the Hessian now, right? So we get um, E squared L dx squared times delta x plus, now we're going to get this mixed term, e squared l dx d lambda times delta lambda. 
equals zero. Okay, so what's this mixed term? Partial squared L, partial X, partial lambda. Anyone see that? What is that? It's literally just the constraint Jacobian, right? Cool. It's actually DCDX transpose. Um, yeah. Nope. Uh, and then we're going to do the constraint stuff too. So we get grab respect to lambda. We're going to do the same Taylor expansion thing. So this is C of X plus partial C, partial X, delta X. And we're going to set this all equal to zero. And if I like sort of rearrange this in the standard way, right? Um, I'm going to take this whole thing and I'm going to just move some stuff around. So I'm going to write this as partial C, partial X times delta X equals minus C of X. And you'll see in a second why I'm doing this. Okay, so now I'm going to take all of that and stack it up into one giant linear system. And that's going to look like this. So I get the Hessian over here, the Hessian of the Lagrangian. And then this is zero. And then over here, I've got delta x, delta lambda. And then I've got the gradient of L with respect to X and minus C of X. So I just, yeah, I, I wrote out explicitly the second line getting rearranged. The top one is the same story. I just moved, moved some stuff around. Okay, cool. Has anyone seen this before? I know my students have, yeah. So you can do this either way. There's some subtlety in there. So the Lagrangian is linear in lambda, right? Because of that, I can decide to write it as either lambda or delta lambda here. And all that's going to do is change what shows up over here. So right, the way I've done it right now is actually consistent with the Taylor expansion, which is why I did it this way. You can cheat and stick the whole lambda in here, um, in which case the right-hand side changes slightly. It basically, then it's... Here, I, this is really rad x. If you put lambda here, you're actually sucking in a big chunk of, or you're, you're actually basically removing the entire Lagrange multiplier term from here. So it's not actually grab, rad x anymore of, of lambda l. It's a slightly different thing, but you, it's legal. The reason you can do that is because it's linear in lambda, right? So it doesn't matter. Okay, so people sometimes do that. It depends on the sort of solver you're using, actually, when that's advantageous versus not. The way we're going to look at this, this is kind of, this is, I would say, consistent with just doing the Taylor expansion and like standard Newton. Um, and also, this is nice if you're doing a line search, because you can backtrack on both X and lambda together in a consistent way. If you, the way you're talking about doing it, where it's just lambda, that people do that, um, that's mostly done in SQP methods for some like, like under the hood kind of complicated reasons. Um, but that way, for example, you might do that if you were doing a trust region method where you didn't care. Um, and there's other kind of specific on in the weeds reasons in terms of specific solver architecture where you might want to do it that way or prefer one or the other. Yeah, OSQP is, is sort of doing some, they're not doing it this way. They're doing a very different solver method that where that sort of works for them. Um, yeah, there's more to say about that, but I will, I will not <laughs> in the interest of like keeping us on the rails and whatever. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically a detail. Okay, so this is called a KKT system. This linear system specifically. So KKT conditions are like the nonlinear set the gradient equal to zero conditions. And then when you linearize it and do Newton's method on it, you get a linear system that looks like this. Um, in particular, what can we say about this linear system? It's symmetric, right? Uh, is it positive definite? It doesn't. It's never positive definite, actually. It is symmetric, right? And which is kind of obvious here. But it turns out the Hessian is symmetric also. But the whole thing is actually never positive definite. It's um, This is a detail that's not obvious that maybe I will show you in detail. But basically, um, 
This guy, you want to be positive definite, like we were talking about before. And that makes sense. It turns out, though, um, this has a big zero block over here. So this could never be positive definite because of this block. The best you could ever hope for is it being positive semi definite, like having a bunch of zero eigenvalues. It turns out, though, what this thing has, the structure it has, is it's got a bunch of positive eigenvalues associated with minimizing the, the objective. So the, so the eigenvalues associated with like the primal variables here, the, the x's, are all positive. So the eigenvalues associated with the duals, i.e. The, the Lagrange multipliers, it turns out are all negative. So in like a, the convex setting where things are nice, what you actually want is for this thing to have like n positive eigenvalues and m negative eigenvalues. That's like the way it should look. Does anyone know what that means then, like about this thing in terms of what kind of optimization problem we're solving overall when we look for both of these? The saddle point. So specifically, what are we doing? We're minimizing with respect to the x's, and what are we doing with respect to the lambdas? We're maximizing with respect to the lambdas. And there's sort of like a lot of interesting interpretation behind that. And this is kind of where this like idea of primal and dual variables come from in the naming. Turns out you're, what you're really doing here is solving like a mini max problem uh, where you're minimizing over x and maximizing over lambda and you're looking for a saddle point uh, where they're both satisfied. Oh, thanks. Okay. Any cool? So there's these these sorts of linear systems that you can imagine these show up in all of optimization. Okay. Um, and so there's actually lots of work that's gone into solving KKT systems, like this specific type of linear system, because they show up in literally all of optimization, every optimization solver, blah, blah, blah. So people care about that. It's kind of interesting. Um, and maybe we'll do a little bit more on this like idea of primal dual and max and min and whatever in a little bit. Okay, so one thing I do want to point out, though, if we dig into this a tiny bit more, um, important note is that this thing over here is not the Hessian of S. It's not the Hessian of the objective function. It's the Hessian of the Lagrangian, right? So let's write out what that is. Um, so we're going to talk about this little idea of right now. Um, I'm going to point out something to you, and then this, this has a name. Uh, this is called the Gauss-Newton method, which you may have heard of. And what's going on there is if I actually write down that Hessian of the Lagrangian thing, it's the Hessian of the objective plus this other term that looks something like this. Right. So it's these like second derivatives of the constraints, right? Okay, so this is, um, in general, this involves computing a third rate tensor. And this guy's a Jacobian matrix, and I have to take another derivative of it. So it ends up being a third rank tensor. And in general, that's like one of the most expensive things to compute in the whole like Newton solve. It doesn't have to be actually. If you're if you're clever and you know about automatic differentiation and stuff like this, uh, it turns out, right? Look at the structure of this. I'm taking the gradient of this thing in here, which is actually if I take this Jacobian and contract it, like multiply it by the lambda, this whole thing going to vector. So this whole thing going to matrix. So if you naively do this and like chain roll into here, you end up with a big tensor thing. But if you're smart about it and you do automatic differentiation, you can do that efficiently, but like that's complicated and weird as an aside. Um, but generally speaking, this term here is very expensive to compute and is this third rank tensor thing. So a lot of times people don't want to do that. So often you'll just drop it, like literally just drop this whole term. And instead of Hessian of the Lagrangian, you'll just put the Hessian of the objective in there. And that's called the Gauss-Newton method. So you'll hear this also called the constraint curvature term. And when you do this, it's called Gauss Newton. Let's see.
and whatever. Uh, so what, what else is there to say about this? Um, this is slightly slower to converge than full Newton usually. In terms of iteration count, um, but if you are sort of naively computing that tensor thing, and which is very expensive, it's often cheaper per iteration. So it often wins in terms of wall clock time. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, so it turns out this thing, if we have a nice objective, so we usually make this up, right? And um, so this is always, this can always be positive definite or often is because we get to make it up. This term, however, if this is a nonlinear constraint, this guy will often be whatever. Right. So it turns out while this guy can be nice and positive definite, you can often get this guy being indefinite and stuff. And we don't like that. And so you'll have to regularize this guy. If you're going to regularize this anyway, you might as well just get rid of this because you're already sort of messing with your problem. Right. So, um, yeah. So generally speaking, if the objective is convex, Gauss Newton is well behaved and doesn't necessarily need a regularizer. Whereas this guy, if you have not this chain, you'll still need to regularize it. At which point you might as well just do gas Newton, in, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Okay. So maybe we can try this. Give me a sec. Didn't. Okay, let's see if we can do this. I have homework solutions open, so I have to close all that first. <laughs> didn't get this ready before. Hopefully this isn't gonna be terrible. Okay, cool, I think we're in business. Okay, so this is like basically the picture I drew. Um, so let's try to see that for a sec. Yeah, okay, so. However, this is with a not. So this is a nice little quadratic objective function. These are level curves like I drew. But what we're, we're going to do now is have a nonlinear constraint. So c of x equals 0 is this parabola now. So we have to be on the parabola, which is slightly more annoying and terrible than the linear constraint I drew before. OK, so we're going to take some Newton steps. Uh, so we're going to start here. So the, the solution here intuitively is somewhere over here, right? OK, let's see what happens. So remember, uh, OK, Newton step, cool. So what happened? So if you think about this, right, what I did in the Newton step is I linearized the constraint, which is actually saying I'm going to move in this tangent plane to the constraint here, the tangent line, right? So this is saying like to first order with Newton's method, if you think about what's going on, it's basically saying, okay, I have to stay in this like feasible set, like I've, which the linearized version though, which is along the line. So when I solve that one problem, what it did is say, okay, I want to minimize subject to staying on this tangent line here, which is there, right? So it like makes intuitive sense when you think about the algorithms doing like this behavior, right? But this isn't necessarily super nice and like what we want, right? Um, but let's see, will it figure itself out? Yeah, so now move back, right? Because what it did was take the linearization here, which is, again, some tangent line that kind of looks like this. So now it's trying to hop back onto the constraint. If I run this a couple more times, it'll converge to a reasonable answer and, like, basically the answer we expected, right? Okay, there we go. So, like, three, four iterations, like before, pretty good, right? Okay, let's try some other stuff. 
Uh, so what I'm going to try now is another, we're going to start in another place. We're going to start in a like slightly sadistic place and see what happens. Okay, so now I'm going to start over here. And uh, so like tangent line, we think maybe we'll do something like this, right? And that, that may be a word. Let's see what Newton's method does. So this makes sense. I took a step down here along the tangent direction, right? Trying to get closer to the optimum. Now I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to try to linearize there, blah, blah, blah. This all makes sense so far. Uh, what happened there? I stepped back here, right? This is bad. So now what's going to happen? It looks like I'm getting stuck sort of in somewhere over here, right? It's where the algorithm is converging to. Anyone have any thoughts on what happened there? Why did it do that? No, right? Like, so down here, remember, I was down here before and I went over here. So that's all good. Like the, the minimum is here. The minimum of the objective functions over here. Somehow I ended up like getting stuck over here after I moved along the tangent direction, you know, a bunch. And I'm actually stuck in an infeasible spot. I'm not even on the constraint, right? It's like a really weird behavior. Maybe I'll get there if I keep running it, but like very clearly I'm getting stuck over here. Anyone have any thoughts? So kind of, sort of, yeah. It, so what's going on there is, here, let's check this out. Here's the like, this is the punchline. That's like the same as last time. So like, here's the Hessian of the Lagrangian. So I've got the Hessian of F plus this annoying tensor term that's the got the sort of derivatives of the, the cur constraint curvature. Check this out. I got a negative eigenvalue. So even though F, right, F is this nice convex function, but because I have a nonlinear constraint, the Hessian of the Lagrangian can go indefinite because of the constraint curvature term. So the takeaway message is, even if you have a convex objective, if you have nonlinear constraints, you still have to regularize. So like the natural thing to do here would be to regularize this guy. I can fix it that way. The other thing I can do is take instead a Gauss-Newton step instead. And I'll just show you that real quick. So this has no such problems, right? We're gonna do the exact same starting point and now we're gonna do with Gauss-Newton. And here, because I'm just ignoring those terms, the Hessian's always gonna stay positive definite. So this is the same starting point, blah, blah, blah. This seems fine, right? But now I'm going to keep trucking around that bottom and sort of more or less behave like we did last time and get to the answer and say five or six steps, right? Cool, converged. Okay, so that's sort of a takeaway. Uh, I don't know, Newton versus Gauss Newton on a non, non convex problem. Uh, where'd my mouse go? Any questions about this? Anyone want to try anything else? I guess I'm curious like, how compressed this scenario is versus like, um... Yeah, are, are there equal places where Gauss-Newton will fail? So yeah, Gauss-Newton in general, um, so the way the failure modes are different. So here you can fail because of non-convexity of the overall problem and like whatever you get stuck in weird places. Uh, what'll happen often with Gauss-Newton is you'll get stuck on the constraint manifold in, in a place where like, the, like if you have a very wiggly constraint, you can end up stuck in like some local optimum on the constraint manifold where like, because it doesn't have that constraint curvature information, it sort of can't see ahead to where there's like maybe a better local optimum. So you will get failure modes like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, um, you'll get sort of slightly slower convergence with Gauss-Newton on a, on a situation like Another interpretation, by the way, of Gauss-Newton is that you're linearizing the constraints um, before doing Newton's method. Right? It's basically I'm ignoring that constraint curvature term. Another way of saying that is you're assuming the constraints are linear, right? And then applying Newton's method. There's fancier names for this. This is now what people are calling sequential convex programming. So the idea is you convexify the problem first and then solve a convex problem. That's just what you get here. So if I convexified the problem, I would have like linearized the constraints, right? And taken a convex approximation of the objective and then solve that convex problem. That turns out to correspond in this case, right, to Gauss Newton. Mm -hmm. So Gauss Newton is like closely related to these, like essentially, if you do successive convex blah blah blah, which is currently hot, you'll be doing Gauss Newton mm -hmm. in some form. Okay, that was long winded. Okay, so takeaways from this. Let's see if I can get okay, come back. Okay. So what do we do? Um, so 
So this was fine. And then when we started at this other point, we got this behavior where uh, Newton gets stuck. And Gauss-Newton doesn't. So basically, the overall takeaway from this, though, is that uh, these things can both work, um, but you're going to, in general, have to regularize. in Newton's method, even if the objective is convex. So it's sort of strictly harder and more annoying, right? Um, and then also in robotics, it's uber common to just use Gauss-Newton because those tensor terms are annoying to deal with and, and generally expensive. And you almost always, I'd say, if you're computing those tensor terms, like naively, Gauss-Newton's always going to win in wall clock time, basically. Uh, yeah, both in like state estimation, um, like all the SLAM stuff, like GT SAM, et cetera, that's all Gauss Newton. And then in control, too, like most of the control stuff is, is doing Gauss Newton in practice. So um, there are papers, there's actually a pretty recent paper on doing full Newton efficiently for control problems, where they do some clever AD stuff to like make that term. Uh, this is why I brought it up. So that, pub that paper was maybe published last year, though. So like in general, everything's Gauss-Newton uh, unless you've done something smart. Okay, end of equality constraints unless anyone has any other, anybody? Good, okay. So now we're gonna switch over to inequality constraints. And I'm gonna talk about this right now as just the inequalities. And in general though, you're just gonna combine this with the stuff we already talked about to do you know, sort of both. So now we're going to switch over to like C of X greater than equal to zero. Um, and we're just going to look at the inequalities right now. Um, and then, yeah, in general, you would do what we're going to talk about now in combination with the equality stuff we just talked about and just kind of stack it all together, and it's no big deal. Okay, so the big thing here is talking about the first order necessary conditions for these, which in words are identical, but in math are significantly more complicated and in terms of solving them a lot more challenging. All right, so first order necessary conditions. Derivative of grad f equals zero, again, in the free directions, right? Exactly the same. And then we have that the constraints have to be satisfied. So C of x now is greater than equal to zero instead of just equal to zero, right? Okay, so maybe I should draw the picture again. Hold this. Seems somewhat dangerous. Let's see if I can do this. So if I have this situation again, again, yeah, pretty, pretty crap drawing. Apologies. And then I've got this guy. I should actually make this tangent. Close enough. There we go. Okay, so we got the C of X 
we've got our gradients here, right? And then this guy uh, is, think about this for a sec. So over here, we're gonna have rad F, same deal, right? Okay, so the way to think about this, so we're gonna have the same stuff as before. So in particular, we're gonna end up with this guy. Oh, let's see. Okay, and we're gonna have this one, which is sort of trivial. The constraint has to be satisfied. Now we get some new stuff though, which is all about encoding this idea of free directions, right? Okay, so let's think about this. If I go, oh, and I did flip the signs, damn. Okay, this is where the sign actually matters, going back to your last comment. Okay, so what's gonna happen here? If I'm over here, this is say, see here is this like, you know, increasing this way, right? And I want it to be greater than equal to zero. Uh, what did I do here? I gotta make sure I, this is dangerous. Okay, so actually we're gonna swap this. So it lines up with what I wrote over there. So we're gonna make C increasing this way. Okay, because otherwise the, so if this thing's increasing this way, right? It's greater than equal to zero over this whole half space, in which case the minimum is just there, right? So what I wanna do is make it go this way so that the feasible space is over here, right? So I'll write that in like, I should do that in the lighter annoying green color. So it's clear this is the feasible region. Everyone cool with that? So this is where C is greater than zero and C is less than zero over there. And the gradient points this way, right? Everyone cool with that? So the answer then has to be in this half space. And intuitively, I want to find the point in here that's closest to the minimum, which is going to be basically like right there, not like before, right? Okay, now we get to draw pictures of the arrows and think about this a little bit. So here's grad C. Here's del F. If I wrote just this, like we had last time, this would be sort of like, um, the way to think about this is free direction now, here is anything over here, right? If I'm up against here though, basically when I'm at this spot, this is a free direction, but this is not, right? So how do I encode that in Lambda? I don't have any thoughts on this. So yeah, basically what I have to do now is I have to put a condition on the sign of lambda. So before when it was an equality constraint and I was like saying essentially it has to be on here and this is the only free direction, right? Now the situation is, and I could have no component in this grad C direction. Now I can have this, but I can also have anything with a positive component along grad C, right? I just can't have a negative component along grad C. Everyone got that? Cool. So then like intuitively, then what I'm going to do is put a condition on the sign of lambda. And I'm going to say lambda has to be positive. Cool. Everyone get that? So this is where things get really annoying though. There's different, you can make up the sign conventions here are arbitrary and you can make, you can pick different ones. So you have to be very careful with the sign conventions on this. Like basically I drew this the, a different way. We could have had the opposite sign convention and blah, blah, blah. So, so you will see that happen. Um, okay. So that's cool. This says now that basically I'm allowed to have a component of the gradient pointing into the feasible direction, but not over here. Cool. And then the last condition, which I think I'm just going to have to write down and then we'll talk about it because I it's a little bit tricky to sort of explain with drawing alone. And then these all have names. Okay, so these are the general KKT conditions. The last ones we did were a special case, right? Where you didn't have inequalities. Um, okay, so these have names. We'll write the names down. So this one's called stationarity. Which stationary point, fixed point, gradient equals zero. That's where that comes from, right? 
This one is called primal feasibility. Feasibility meaning uh, respects the constraint, right? And primal referring to the X variables. So it's saying that the Xs are feasible, right? The primals are feasible. Okay, this one is called dual feasibility because we have now a native quality constraint on the duals, right? To make that gradient condition work out. So it's, they have to be positive. So lambdas sub, uh, obey the constraints, dual feasibility. The last one is called complementarity. And here's where this comes from. Does anyone know where this comes from? Like, what is this last one doing? So we explained all the other ones with the picture. The last one is sort of kind of tricky and like not obvious what's going on. It's not orthogonality. So it turns out what that's doing is encoding switching behavior. So um, if my minimum is in the interior, then it just looks like uh, an unconstrained problem, right? Whereas if my minimum is in the infeasible set and I'm up against the constraint, then I need my Lagrange multipliers to do something, right? So what this is encoding is that fact. So this says if the constraints are, um, so what this saying is I only can have my Lagrange multiplier turned on if the constraints are zero, i.e. Uh, if I'm up against the constraint surface, right? So if I'm up against the constraint surface, then this looks like a constrained problem. Lambda turns on, and that basically looks like I have an equality constraint. If I'm in the feasible set and C is non-zero, right? So in this case, right, C is positive, right? If I'm in the interior and I'm not up against the constraint, then this guy's positive and the lambda has to be zero for this to be satisfied. So it means I'm turning off the constraint handling, basically, right? I'm turning off all of the Lagrange multiplier stuff and anything associated with the constraints has to be zeroed out. Does that make sense? So literally what that term's doing is like, switching on and off the constraint stuff, depending on whether I'm in the interior and away from the boundary or up against the boundary. That makes sense? So literally with, with this guy, you know, when this is in the interior, all this drops out, right? Literally all of this goes away and I just have an original unconstrained problem. When I'm up against the boundary, it turns this on and then all of a sudden it actually looks exactly like an equality constraint problem, right? So this, all this stuff is basically associated with this switching logic more or less that like handles the equality versus like the, the inequality case where you're on the boundary versus not. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to write that down now. I said it all out loud. Yeah, it's, it's actually, um, it's not that it turns out. So it turns out it's equivalent to that, but that may be slightly confusing. And so to, it's well, it's actually wrong, actually. So, so the better way to it turns out that with all of the conditions, you can write lambda transpose C and that's right, but that alone is actually wrong. It's not that notion of orthogonality. Mathematically, a better way to write it, you're going to force me to write it this way, which I will then have to explain what this means. But you're so just to, to pick on that, it's actually this where it, so that's a called a Hadamard product, it's an element wise product. So what this literally is, is that lambda i times c i has to be strictly zero for all i. So it's an element y. That's why it's called complementarity. It turns out it's, it turns out that that Hadamard product version, when you combine it with the positivity constraints is equivalent to, you can put the transpose there, but you can only put the transpose there with right. all of these together, right? It turns out it's equivalent to this, but this is kind of more correct. And if you kind of had that in your brain, uh, then I definitely want to write it this way because because that's not right. Yeah, does that make sense? So yeah, basically it's strict zeros for all the yeah. components, not some notion of orthogonality. Okay, there's another way to there's there's actually like roughly three different ways to write these. I wrote it there in like the most standard way you'll see in textbooks. There's another way to write it that I kind of like that I wasn't going to talk about it, but uh, it's it's this. Um, So this one, it turns out, this actually subsumes all three of these into this one-liner, which I kind of like and is kind of slick. And this one is much less common and you won't see in any books, though. And I didn't want to confuse you. 
So that that's another fun, fun version of this. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Okay, so yeah, intuition here. So when I say a constraint is active, I mean that the inequality holds with equality. So I have C of X equals zero. Then lambda gets to be non-zero. And this actually looks exactly like the equality case. And then if the constraint is inactive, and I have C of X greater than zero, i.e. in the interior, then I get lambda has to equal zero. And then this whole thing looks like an unconstrained problem. Okay. And so like kind of the way to think about it is complementarity sort of encodes on off switching. Uh, I can't spell. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is give you like a little tiny survey of the ways we solve these things. So with like the equality constraint case, we basically just stacked everything up and did Newton and it looked like before and it was no big deal, right? So it turns out you cannot do that with these. Um, these are much, much gnarlier. Actually, I should write a little note about this Hadamard product thing. That's kind of weird. Um, so yeah, it turns out you can't take this set of KKP conditions and just throw Newton at it. Doesn't work. Um, you can get close to that. The closest approach to that is, is our, our primal dual interior point methods, which almost do that. But in general, we need like much fancier ways of handling this. The kind of like the heart of why this is hard and why you can't just throw Newton at it is this on off switching behavior. Basically, that on-off switching is non-smooth, and Newton's method and gradient-based methods in general assume you have gradients and things are smooth, so you can you know, take your Taylor expansion. But when I kind of take this boundary and I have this discrete switching, nothing's smooth, the gradients are not well-defined of this whole thing, right? So basically, all bets are off, um, which is why, by the way, this is a very useful way of encoding contact dynamics. <laughs> Because they are also they share all that non-smoothness, right? So methods that work for this work there, numerically speaking. So um, the algorithms that we use to solve these things are quite different, and like it gets a lot more complicated than than just throw Newton at it. So we're going to talk about this real quick. Uh, so much harder. Um, can't just do Newton. And there are lots of options with lots of trade-offs. Okay, so let's talk about some of those. <laughs> Um, so kind of the, maybe the, the, the simplest thing in some sense, um, if you think about the switching action of those complementary things is to do what's called an active set method. And so the idea is you literally just keep track of which constraints are inactive versus which ones are active. If they're active, you throw it in as an equality constraint and solve it like an equality constraint problem. If it's inactive, you just leave it out 
And so you just solve equality constraint problems and you have this like outer loop that's keeping track of which constraints are switched on or off. So the reason is this outer loop switching logic basically eliminates the complementarity stuff, right? And deals with it separately so that now you can just think about equality constraint problems in your Newton solver, right? Um, so that can work really well actually um, with some caveats. <laughs> You need some way to keep track or guess or whatever. And then you're just solving equality constrained problems. So what do you think, what, what do you think like kind of like, you know, the key thing about making these work well or where do they work well versus not? You don't have any thoughts on this? Basically, if you can guess the act of set right, these are awesome and super fast and super good. If you can't guess it right well, or you don't have a good heuristic, then it's really bad. In general, combinatorially bad, right? Um, so basically, these kind of things um, are combinatorial in the number of inequality constraints, right? So in general, you'd have to guess every single possible combination of on-off for every single constraint. Right? And that's terrible, and that'll take forever because you have to literally enumerate all possible combinatorial number of active sets, right? So you don't want to do that. But in practice, in a lot of cases, we have very good heuristics for guessing whether we're active or not. Uh, in, in, in control problems, this is possible a lot of the time. Uh, there's many, many examples. So if you have some kind of problem specific like domain knowledge where you can write down a good heuristic for guessing the active set, these things are great and win. If you don't have that, then they're combinatorially terrible and you shouldn't do them. That's basically it. So basically just kind of branching down. Um, it's not exactly branch and bound, but it's, you can imagine it's sort of like that in some sense. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, you, you can write them that way actually. So like this is, you can equivalently write this as a mixed integer problem, like a binary, you know, E thing. Um, so yeah, you can think about it that way. There are much sort of nicer, more specialized techniques you can use on this. This is like a special case of, of that mixed integer thing, right? That's a little bit more benign, but in general, if you don't have good ways of guessing active sets, this is not a winning strategy. Okay, so that's one way to go. Um, some really good work on these things though, right? If you can guess well, and it turns out there are lots of problems where you can guess well, like 99.9% .9 of the time, you can guess right the first try, in which case these are awesome. Okay, another way to go. Barrier or interior point methods. And probably everyone's heard of these. Who, who has, who's heard of interior point methods, barrier methods, most people. Some people, okay. So these are kind of the gold standard for small to medium sized convex problems. Um, and there's lots to say about this, lots of theory for these guys, but the, the gist is you replace your inequalities with a so-called barrier function that blows up to infinity at the constraint. And there's, um, these were invented in like the, I don't know, like the, the really good versions of this came out in the 90s. And then there was like a ton of research on these over about a decade between the late, late 90s to through the like early 2000s. Um, and they were a huge deal. Uh, so here, I'll, I'll write down and we'll, so we take this. So what we had before, right? We're going to take this thing and we're going to, transform it into basically min f of x minus this thing. Um, so sum over 
i equals one to m for m constraints. And then we're going to put a log in here. So this is where cix. So these are each, each of the, if I imagine like that C vector having rows or individual scalar constraints, I sort of apply this log element wise to each of them. And so now what I've done is I've gotten rid of this inequality constraint and stuffed it into the objective function, right? And now what that looks like, if I plot it, so if I have like X versus minus log X, I get a thing that's like mostly zero in the interior and then sort of really sharply blows up to infinity at the boundary, right? And so the idea is if I start in the interior, the reason they're called interior point methods is you have to stay in the interior. Right. If I if I violate the constraint here and I end up in the outside of the feasible set, the log is blown up on me and the whole thing doesn't make sense. Right. So these have to stay strictly in the interior. Um, the reason these are a big deal. Oh, maybe I'll write some stuff. Any any questions about that? If you look at this naively, also this is numerically seems like it's a terrible idea because this thing blows up to infinity and like the gradient is going to be super steep and stiffness and all this badness. And it's true. The way I wrote that down, it is numerically terrible and would never work. <laughs> So the, the trick is, there's a bunch of tricks to make these work in practice that people figured out roughly 20 years ago now that make them work really well. And we don't have time to talk about all the tricks. Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what's going on. The tricks are really all about, so like mathematically, that looks great. The issues are all numerical, right? So like in finite precision floating point, this is terrible because infinities and blah, 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 and blowing up. There are tricks to basically get rid of the infinities. And, and that um, they're mathematically rigorous, and I can write this down, but it turns out those tricks are absolutely essential to making this work practically in a computer and finite precision arithmetic. Um, happy to talk more about those if you want to. If we have time after, you know. Um, so these are kind of the gold standard or convex problems. Uh, I, I should say also uh, in quotes, because the definitions of this change say small to medium size. But the definition of small and medium and big is sort of always changing based on where computers are, right? Roughly speaking, anything shy of like you know, millions of variables, big data problems. This is good. Um, and then the other kind of caveat is requires a lot of kind of uh, extra hacks to work on uh, non-convex problems. But people do it and, and it can work well. Um, the reason these are such a big deal, these are the first, or actually, we'll say first practical algorithm to achieve provable polynomial time complexity on convex optimization problems. So these, there's mathematical guarantees behind these guys. You can prove that they can converge to an optimum on a convex problem in polynomial time, which is amazing. Before that, there was no proof that that was possible because everything before that was based on these active set combinatorial kind of things, in which case you'd have to check every possible combinatorial number of combinations, which blows up on you and is bad, right? So these guys have provable polynomial time convergence, which is awesome. Okay, so that's sort of good. Um, there's some other things you might see out there, which are of varying levels of, you know, dubiousness. The first one is like, what I feel like everybody who ever sees an optimization problem in the first time, like tries to do, and it's a terrible idea. Um, these are penalty methods. Uh, so the idea here is you're going to replace inequalities with objective terms that penalize violation, right? And this is this is in stark contrast to the barrier that we talked about before. And I'll, I'll show you kind of, you know, exactly what I mean by that in a sec. So this would be something like, you know, I took my problem and instead of, you know, the log barrier thing, we're gonna do something that looks like this. So we got our f of x and then we're gonna say tack on something like the most common one would be a quadratic penalty. 
and that would look something like this. Uh, so min over zero comma C squared. So the min is there to encode the switching, right? So if I want C to be greater than or equal to zero, this penalizes um, this penalizes only like negative values of C, right? So if C is positive, this the min zeroes it out, right? So that it doesn't penalize anything. And then if I plot this, kind of what it looks like, it's going to be zero in the interior, and then it's going to have this quadratic penalty over here. So this would be sort of the, the penalty term, right? Min zero C of X squared. And this is like zero, 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 and then just starts to look like a quadratic penalty. Okay, so this is different. The picture is quite different, right? Because interior point methods, all of the sort of penalizing is happening in the interior and it blows up to infinity at the boundary and you can never cross the boundary, right? Penalty methods do nothing in the interior and only start to do anything when you've already violated. So that's kind of the, the it's like, it, this is really like an exterior penalty if you want to think about it that way. So that's like one core difference. Um, these are really easy to implement, right? I feel like everyone's tried stuff like this. but they have lots of practical problems. So the biggest one, even on a really benign problem where something like this might work, you basically can never get strict satisfaction of the constraint um, without cranking. In theory, if you write down the math and you analyze the convergence of this, it turns out you have to crank the row to infinity here to get it to actually strictly satisfy the constraints. Um, and so again, there's like infinities floating around and that's bad and numerically gonna cause you problems. But if you only want a coarse answer, this could be a, you know, this could work fine. I don't recommend you do it though. It's sort of, there are better things to do. Um, there's one other kind of like core thing I want to point out here. So uh, um, basically like we talked about the active set thing and like, the fact that kind of very inherently these problems are non-smooth, right? There's this like switching action on off when you hit the constraint. So, you know, active set, that's very explicit, right? We're enumerating active sets and switching explicitly. And this penalty method, it shows up here, right? There's this like switching that happens in the min, right? How about in the in this barrier interior point thing? Is there any switching in there? Where'd it go? Yeah, so it turns out one of the key reason that this works so well, like numerically, is this is actually globally smooth or globally in the, in the feasible set, right? So where this is defined, it's smooth the whole way. And like kind of really the way to think about that is this does nothing at all when X is feasible. This guy has this tiny, tiny penalty when X is feasible, right? And what happens is like crank row, this gets sort of pulled in tighter and tighter and tighter, right? So this kind of like converges to the switching in the limit as row goes to infinity, right? Um, but it turns out you don't actually have to crank it that hard to get machine precision in double precision floating point because it's very steep, right? So it turns out magically this works and is smooth. So Newton's method actually works and you get quadratic convergence rates with this. Uh, so you can get convergence on a convex problem in like four or five Newton iterations with this guy every time, which is slick and kind of the magic secret sauce. Okay, I think that's it for today. We got, we're out of time. I think we, we talked about enough of this stuff.